Welcome to our worship service here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Champaign, Illinois. We are so glad that you could join us today to worship God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Teach us, Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. Jeremiah accuses God of forcing him into a ministry that brings him only contempt and persecution. Yet Jeremiah is confident that God will be a strong protector against his enemies and commits his life into God's hands. A reading from Jeremiah. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around, denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Surely for your sake I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me. Because of my enemies, deliver me. The second reading is from the sixth chapter of Romans, beginning with the first verse. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But we have died with Christ. We believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died Christ died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So also must you consider yourselves dead to sin 
and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel today is found in the 10th chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the 24th verse. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called a master of this house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them. No, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted, so do not be afraid. You are of much more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of our Lord. Father Mike is an Episcopal priest, and he writes a blog which he calls Interrupting the Silence. He's actually a very creative pastor and preacher, and as a way of understanding uh, our gospel for today, he suggests using the image of love triangles. Now, I know that may, may seem like a very strange illustration to use, particularly on a Father's Day, but I'd like you to go with me on this just for a moment and see if it makes sense. So what are love triangles? Well, they're often the subject of movie plots. Sometimes there are circumstances in which a crime is committed. Interestingly, love triangles have played an important role in history, all the way from Mark Antony and Cleopatra to Wallace Simpson and Prince Edward VIII, just to name two well-known ones. I don't know if you ever watched the Showtime series, The Tudors. It came out probably 10 years ago and now is being rebroadcast. A month or so ago, when I was sitting at home not doing a whole lot, I binge-watched all six seasons. It's historical fiction, but it really is the story of Henry VIII, the King of England in the 16th century. And if you remember English history, you also remember that Henry VIII was king of love triangles because his love interests were vast. And as we know, he actually created an entirely new church, the Church of England, in order to get a divorce from his first wife. Catherine of Aragon was a Spanish princess, originally married to Henry's older brother, who later found herself Queen of England by marrying Henry VIII. She was a few years older than her new husband, but Catherine was also very devoted to him and a loving wife. In spite of heartbreaking miscarriages, stillbirths, and Henry's many affairs. She was also a devout Catholic, very loyal to the Pope and the Mother Church. But everything changed when Henry fell in love with Catherine's lady-in-waiting, the captivating Anne Boleyn. Catherine had not given birth to a male heir that was very important to Henry to keep the lineage intact. 
And Anne Boleyn had given him a daughter. And he wanted Henry to marry her, not just have him her as his mistress. And so Henry VIII sought a divorce from the Pope, but the Pope refused. And so in his desire to get away from Catherine, get a divorce, and marry his true love Anne, Henry broke off from Rome and formed his own church, the Church of England. And as king, Henry became head of the church. And as head of the church, he could give himself a divorce, which he did. Then Henry married Anne. And they had the future, Queen Elizabeth I. But later, Henry had Anne beheaded because he found another love interest by the name of Jane Seymour. Love triangles. All of us have compelling and competing loyalties in our lives. And the truth is that love triangles are a part of our lives. So let me explain what I mean. All of us have competing loves, people we love, things we love, activities and pleasures we love. And when we look at ourselves, we're probably in several of these love triangles at the same time. But the question is always one of priority and commitment and loyalty. So in the classic romantic love triangle, there are typically three people. One is usually stuck between two love interests, and the love interests, knowingly or unknowingly, are competing with each other and vying for the time, the attention, the energy, and the love of the third person. But there are also other love triangles. And in today's Gospel, Matthew 10, verse 37, Jesus specifically holds up two of these love triangles. He says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Those are pretty strong words. In that first triangle, there's Jesus, there's us and our parents. In the second triangle, there's Jesus, there's us and our children. And again, these are by no means the only love triangles we have in our lives. Love triangles can involve anyone or anything that we love. Every love triangle confronts us with two essential questions. Number one, what is the most important relationship in your life? Who do you love or what do you love the most? And the second question, where is your most important commitment? Jesus says, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In other words, if you can't make that commitment, you can't follow Jesus. Love triangles are always places of struggle and conflict. Regardless of what I would like to say or will think, what evidence of my life shows that I am in such a triangle? What about the ring on my hand and the vows I made to Susan 50 years ago? Do I choose Jesus over Susan? What about my children, my grandchildren? Do I choose one over the other? Is that what Jesus meant I must do in order to follow him? Well, one of the ways to begin to make some sense of these words of Jesus is to think about these love triangles in terms of what the psychiatrist Murray Bowen says about relationship triangles. When you study Maury Bowen's theory, you find that it actually applies not only to families, but it really applies to all kinds of groups and systems, including congregations. What he is looking at are the relationships that we all have in our lives. And his basic idea is that there are always two forces that are operating simultaneously. There's the togetherness force, and then there's the individuality force. And the goal in healthy relationships is to keep these two forces in some kind of balance. When we lose this balance, we tend to fuse with the group. And fusion happens when individual choices are set aside for the sake of harmony within the family or other system. And we lose ourselves in the process. And when that happens, Bowen says that we are unable to 
self-differentiate. And then triangles can form. Triangulation is not healthy because it makes differences and conflicts worse. For example, let's say that I have an issue with you and we're not getting along. But instead of dealing directly with you, I talk to someone else about you. So I triangulize our relationship by bringing another person into that relationship. And when that happens, conflict increases. In triangles, people who are vying for attention begin to assume or assign blame. They may even identify a scapegoat. They begin to distance themselves from others, and in larger family systems, they distance themselves from one another. So back to Jesus' words. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who will find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So what are and where are my loves? Where do I spend most of my time and energy? Where do I spend most of my money and financial resources? When you honestly answer those questions, you answer the essential question. Who or what do I love the most? I remember a story about this very avid golfer who literally played golf every single day of the week. His wife had other interests, thankfully, but his love was golf. One morning he woke up and discovered that electricity was off in his home. Couldn't turn on the coffee maker, he couldn't fix breakfast, he couldn't watch television, he couldn't turn on the lights, he couldn't get his garage door open to drive to the car to the golf course, and so he was forced to stay in his own home for almost the entire day until power finally came back on. Next day, he's back at the golf course, and he was describing this whole story and situation to his buddies. And then he said, but you know what? Even though I had to stay home all day, I had a really good conversation with my wife. And you know what? She's really a very nice person. Today's gospel holds before us and confronts us with the many love triangles that are part of our lives. But Jesus is also demanding that we make a choice. If we want to follow him, we need to make our primary loyalty and commitment to him. Does that mean that we must reject our parents or children or spouses or all our other love interests? No, that's not what Jesus is saying or asking. Jesus is not demanding exclusivity, but he is demanding priority. Jesus does not want to be just one of a number of our love interests. Jesus gave up everything for us. He gave up his life for us. Why would you then want some priority to be more important than him? Jesus is the embodiment of God in human life, in flesh and blood, and he died for us. If Jesus asks us to love him more than our own parents and children, our own flesh and blood, then he also does that with everything else in our lives because there can only be one primary relationship in our life. And Jesus says, it ought to be him. His demand for primacy is not limited to our mother or father or son or daughter. It's a primacy that includes everything and everyone in our life. Jesus could have made the list more. He could have said, whoever loves friends more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves work more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves power and reputation and wealth more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves country and flag more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves politics, agendas, ideology more than me is not worthy of me. 
Whoever loves church, denomination, beliefs, and practices more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves himself more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves anyone or anything more than me is not worthy of me. So I ask you again, what are the love triangles in your life? What is your most important relationship? Who or what do you love the most? And as I said, Jesus is not interested in being one of many. His demand for priority is for our own good as well as the good of all of our love interests. We can only ever have one primary relationship, and that one relationship is what gives us our identity and gives us our meaning and direction. That relationship becomes the lens through which we see the world. It becomes the lens in which we see one another. It becomes the lens on how we see ourselves. It's the foundation on which we build our lives. It guides the choices we make. It guides the words we say, the ways in which we act and relate, and it determines how we love, what we love, and who we love. There was a couple who were in extensive marriage counseling with their pastor over several months. And as they began to improve communication and their religious, uh, relationship got better, the wife expressed her insights this way. She told her husband, darling, when you love God the most, you love me the best. And there's great wisdom in what she said, because that perspective breaks the triangle. No one is left out. No one is excluded. No one is rejected. And God, not ourselves, becomes the source and origin of our love. This is the love by which we take up our cross and follow Jesus. And it's the same love with which Jesus loved us. I want to love my wife best. I want to love my children and grandchildren best. I want to love each of you best. I think we all want to love as best we can, but we can only do that when we choose God first. We love each other best when we get love God most. Or as Stephen Covey used to say, the main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. Finally, let's look at that last verse, verse 39. What does it mean to lose my life? Those who find their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Well, it means that I don't control my life anymore. I don't trust in myself, but I entrust myself to the one who controls my life. Do I have the final word about my life and myself? Am I my own person, or do I belong to someone else? Jesus said in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price, therefore do not become slaves of men. Am I operating on the spirit of self-ownership? If I do, then I'm seeking to save my life, seeking to own my life. And I have set limits on what God can control and what I can control. And when I try to maintain myself in the presence of God through my works, through my efforts, through my own actions, I am obviously trying to save myself. I may not call it that. But as long as my works are the basis of my relationship with God, I'm trying to save myself. And in the end, I will lose my life. It is the very nature of human beings to be dependent upon God. But we also have this desire for independence when we want to do everything my way instead of God's way. And when that happens, we will always end up losing our life. Jesus' call to discipleship means he is our priority. And every other claim on our identity and loyalty is secondary. Jesus knew how scary that commitment was. But he also gave us his word and promise. In verse 29, remember he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. 
and even the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. The answer to fear is faith. The answer to fear is putting our loyalty and commitment in its proper place. When God in Christ is our first and ultimate priority, all of the other loves, everything else we care about, falls into place. That's the message of the gospel today. Believe it. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another in the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Expansive God, you bring diverse voices together to form your church. Open our hearts and unstop our ears to learn from one another. The differences might not overshadow our baptismal unity. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Providing God, your creation shows us that life comes from death. Renew the places where our land air and waterways have been ill for too long. Direct the work of all who care for birds and their habitats. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Protecting God. Sustain and keep safe all who work to defend others across the world, especially those involved in the Peace Not Walls campaign in Palestine and Israel, and all those who accompany immigrants and migrant children through our Emparo program. Revive and strengthen organizations dedicated for caring for refugees and migrants while their homelands struggle for peace. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in El Salvador. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Loving God, you promise to be with all who are persecuted for your sake. Guide all who speak your word of justice and console any who are tormented or targeted for being who they are. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, you are with us, and we are never alone. Bless all fathers and father figures who strive to love and nurture as you do. Comfort all who long to be fathers, and all for whom this day is difficult. Be especially, Lord, with Tom Holm, and his family as Tom was diagnosed with cancer this past week. Surround him with your grace and your love and your peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reigning God, you bless us with guides and caretakers in the faith. As we give thanks for those who have died, especially for the translator and evangelist Onesimus Nezib, increase our care for one another until we walk with them in newness of life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on a desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness, to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O oh God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, Deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call upon you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. And now let us join together in the prayer that our Lord and Savior Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us for the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. favor and his peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.